Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome uh, to tonight's uh, National Fellow Online Lecture Series. Um, my name is James Robinson. I am an assistant attending in uh, primary sports medicine at Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City. Um, and so I'm going to be moderating and leading uh, tonight's lecture. Um, the lecture tonight is a little different. So it's uh, what CAQ review session. Um, so the format that what we'll do is we're going to take some sample CAQ questions. Um, then there'll be a poll that comes up and you, you'll you get about 30 seconds to submit your answer. And then um, we'll kind of see what the group thought. And then we'll go over the answers, kind of talk about why one, you know, why the, that's the correct answer, or why some of the other ones may not be correct. And then kind of talk about the general topics. Um, I try to pick a good mixture. Almost all the questions come from one of these two books. So um, I highly recommend these books for studying for the CAQ. So you have the AMSSM Sports Medicine CAQ Study Guide. That's uh, purely like a question and answer book. So it's just got tests um, that you can take. Um, and then it has a section behind it that not only has the answer, but it also explains it. And then you have the sports medicine study guide and review for the boards. And that's more got the general topics that are on the boards as a study guide. And then it does have some questions and answers at the end. So, um, uh, so just so uh, recap, the National Fellow Online Lecture Series is sponsored by the AMSSM Online Fellows Education Subcommittee, which is part of the AMSSM Education Committee and the AMSSM Fellowship Committee. Um, this is to serve as an adjunct to your individual programs, educational programming. Um, it provides fellows with direct access to educational members with experienced AMSSM members and invited guest speakers. And, and again, the, the point of this is to aid in CAQ exam preparation. Um, so for tonight, um, mute your devices and turn off your video. That just helps with the functionality. If you have questions, you can put them in the chat and I will answer them. If you have questions about the specific question we're on, go ahead and put it in the chat. If you just have general questions about the CAQ, save those to the end. We will have some time at the end to kind of go over those um, and talk about just general CAQ um, questions. Okay, so the general format for the CAQ exam um, oh, sorry. One more, one last thing. Normally, you'll get a you get a survey behind these things. There won't be a survey for tonight's uh, lecture. Um, so the CAQ exam. So it's two sections. Each section has a hundred questions, and you get two hours to complete each section. So you have to answer a hundred questions in two hours. Then you can take an optional fifteen minute break, and then you answer a second set of a hundred questions within two hours. Um, and then the uh, scores are uh, scored. It's just like every other board test or standardized test you take, there's no set score. The score is basically um, they wait for a bunch of people to take the exam and then they figure out the scores based on how people did on the exam. So um, the passing score kind of changes every year. There's no set passing score. Um, so we talked about these two books down here. Highly recommend them for studying other study guides. Um, so if you go to the AMSSM website, there is um, this link gets you to the pest, uh, testing pass. And that that's a bank of like the in-service exams for the fellows. Um, and it's also got some of the recertification exams and things like that, where you can take practice tests. Um, and then there's also CAQ prep classes that are offered by both AMSSM and ACSM. So, um, and those happen at the um, annual meeting and, uh, um, and then they throughout the year at de different other venues. Okay, so let's start here with um, our first question. So you see a high school football player in the training room for an injury that occurred yesterday morning. He says his dog bit him on the arm. On examination, there's a four centimeter long laceration. The wound is fairly deep, but you see no injury to the bone, muscle, or tendon. Uh, there's minimal erythema and swelling. He believes he had a tetanus shot within the last five years. What is the best initial management to prevent infection? A, suture the wound. B, use a cyanoacrylic tissue adhesive to close the wound. C, irrigate and debride the wound. D, give a TD booster.
Okay, so um, this one uh, seemed to be pretty good for everybody. 91% of people got the correct answer, which is um, it is C to irrigate and to breathe the wound. So when um, so this question talks about wound care. So the, again, the big thing in this question is its initial management. So you want to pay attention to these kind of catchphrase words in the um, test. So you know the last sentence of the um, the last sentence of the thing. What is the best initial management to prevent infection? So those are kind of words you you definitely want to pay attention to. So. Um, Irrigation with normal saline or sterile water is the um, best way to um, prevent infection. Typically, you want a minimum of 200 mLs of water to irrigate. As far as it comes to wound closure guidelines, so you can close wounds that are open wounds of less than 12 hours. You can extend that to 18 hours for uncontaminated wounds and 24 hours for head wounds, but this wound doesn't qualify as that. First of all, it's a contaminated wound. Um, and it's been over a day since it first happened. Also, con relative contraindications to wound closure are animal bites, except on the face. Obviously, you don't uh, want to leave someone with a gaping wound on their face um, that will scar. Um, and then puncture wounds. And the reason is because they get infected. So if you close these off, then the, inf the, the bacteria is deep because it's, a, you know, a bite is just like a puncture wound that the tooth is kind of get uh, gone deep into the skin. So now the bacteria is deep in the skin, you close it off, and then that kind of leaves an area for an abscess to form. Um, tissue adhesives are also contraindicated for animal bites, puncture wounds, and contaminated wounds. So again, that would not be um, the answer here. Also, you don't want to use a tissue adhesive um, on wounds of high tension. So in areas like for our athletes, like for example, if our athlete had a laceration on their knee, a derma bond or those other tissue adhesives is not necessarily a very good for that because that's a high tension area and it's not going to hold it very well. Um, now, the, the last answer, the TD booster, you certainly could consider giving them a TD booster, especially since he didn't know if he had had one, but you really don't have to get a TD booster if they've had the booster within the last five years. Or um, now you should also, but you should give one if they haven't had more than three lifetime doses. But again, it wouldn't be the initial management. Um, in this case, also, you should treat them with um, amoxicillin clavulanic acid um, because um, to prevent a pastorella infection. Animal bites, and especially dog bites, are so prone to infection. This is one that you want to prophylactically treat with antibiotics. Um, also, does anyone know what the um, standard of care is for people with a penicillin allergy for an animal bite? You can put it in the chat. Okay, so you can use, um, so it's a double, you have to double cover. So typically you're gonna cover with uh, doxycycline or Bactrim, one of the two. Um, and then you have to cover for the anaerobic. So you have to use like Flagyl or Clindamycin in addition. Um, you can use uh, fluoroquinolones, but it, um, the only fluoroquinolone you can use as a single one is moxifloxacin. Um, but again, in sports medicine, we're not a big fan of fluoroquinolone. So we try not to use those. Um, so question two, um, which of the following is a true statement with respect to adolescent idiopathic scoliosis? A, the less ossification there is at the ileum apophysis, the greater the potential for curve progression. B, Tanner Whitehouse methods of assessment use the epiphysis of the small bones in the foot to stage skeletal maturity. C, the Rizzer grade is a measure of vertebral apophyseal fusion. And D, the majority of idiopathic scoliosis cases have curvature that is convex to the left side. So um, this one was a little bit tougher for people, um, but the majority, 54%, did get the correct answer, which was A, the less ossification there is at the 
iliac apophysis, the greater the potential for the curve to progress. So um, when you talk about a RISR score, the RISR score is the amount of fusion at the iliac apophysis. The lower the RISR score, the more potential for growth, and therefore the more per, um, progression of the curve. So on the right here, you see a RISR score. So if there's no there's absolutely no calcification of the iliac apophysis, that's a RISR score of zero. 25%, uh, 50%, 75%, 100%, and then a completely fused. And that's the way you kind of grade those. Um, Tanner Whitehouse uses the distal radius, the ulna, and the small bones of the wrist, not the foot, to determine skeletal age. That's why B is not correct. Um, C, again, the RISR score is the iliac apophysis, not vertebral apophysis. And then 85 to 90 percent of um, idiopathic scoliosis are convex to the right. Convexity to a left and in adolescent scoliosis should warrant consideration of other causes specifically tumors. So if you ever see a convexity to the left, that's the you know very small percentage of the case and you should actually do a further workup. Does anyone have any questions about that one? This is I, I like to put this on here because you know a lot of people um, don't uh, treat scoliosis and you know and they may not get a lot of um, exposure to scoliosis in their clinic. So you kind of have to think of the, you know, like think back to your fellowship and think of the things that you see every day in your fellowship. And then some of the stuff you may not see as often, that's probably where you want to concentrate your studying for the CAQ. So, you know, for example, I did my fellowship in Andrew Sports Medicine in Birmingham. I didn't study anything about throwers going into the CAQ. I, I had gotten enough of that in my fellowship that I felt pretty confident of being answered, able to answer those questions. But again, like this, none of our um, none of our primary SPAC faculty there treated scoliosis. So that was something I felt like I needed to brush up on. Um, so someone, uh, so Dana Brooks asked, do you get an MRI in all adolescents with uh, levoscoliosis on your patients? And um, again, I don't personally treat uh, scoliosis, but um, I do know that with our pediatric orthopedist, if it's a, um, if it's a convexity to the left, they do get um, usually MRIs and further evaluation on it. Okay, so question three, a 12 year old male baseball pitcher presents to the office with four months of experiencing mild intermittent right groin pain. Pain is an intermittent dull ache and does not prevent him from playing. He reports running normally in his baseball games with no pain. He is the star pitcher on his all-star team and is looking forward to playing this weekend. On physical exam, he has mild pain with hip, right hip internal rotation, but full range of motion. Bilaterally, his strength is normal. His gait is normal. Hamstring and iliopsoas hip flexors are tight and the popliteal angle is 45 degrees bilaterally. He has a positive Thomas test. X-rays of the pelvis are shown below. What is the next best step in management? So A, follow up with orthopedic surgeon next week. Um, do not play in the baseball game this weekend. B, okay to play in the baseball game and follow up if pain increases. C, immediate transport to the ER for urgent orthopedic evaluation, or D, referral to physical therapy to stretch hamstrings and hip flexors and follow up in four weeks. I think someone's trying to write on the on the x-rays. <clears throat> okay. Um, so this one was very difficult for people and it probably, I, I do apologize, it's hard to kind of see these x-rays. In on the actual CAQ, you'll be able to um, expand them. Um, and blow them up so that you can see them better. But only 31% of people got the correct answer, which was C, immediate transport to the ER for urgent orthopedic evaluation. So this is a skiffy. So um, when we're, I'm gonna pull up the x-rays bigger, but the x-rays show a mild right slipped capitis, capital femoral epiphysis, which is always an orthopedic emergency. 
Um, so Klein's line, this is what whoever was drawing over here on the power, on the Zoom. I don't know if you can take that off, but um, uh, was trying to do. So drawing a Klein's line, you draw along the superior femoral neck and that should intersect the epiphysis. Um, now you have another side to compare to, so it should be symmetric. Um, whoops. Um, so the reason this is an orthopedic emergency is blood supply to the epiphysis is tenuous and further injury can lead to avascular necrosis. Once you have avascular necrosis, the treatment is very limited and long-term outcomes are poor. So the treatment should be non-weight bearing, referral to the ER, and they should ideally have surgical pinning of the epiphysis within 24 hours. Um, risk factors for skiffies are boys at age 13 and girls at age 11. It's more common in African-Americans and it's more common in adolescents that are obese. It is bilateral in 30 to 40% of cases. That's why you can't always go with asymmetry. So, you know, you have to be a little bit careful of that because um, you, you could get bilateral. And the symptoms are vague. Groin, thigh, knee pain can all be presenting symptoms. The symptoms don't have to be that severe. They can be very mild. They can be very subtle. This question, I like to call it a distractor. Everything in the question is trying to distract you from the real answer. So it's trying to make you think, oh, this isn't that bad. Oh, it's been going on for four months. Oh, like they, they have full range of motion, you know, and then it's talking about their tight hip flexors and everything. All of that is a distraction. The real question is look at the x-rays and you have your answer. So when we look at these x-rays, so if you draw this the Klein line here, so you see on this left side, you see how it intersects the whole epiphysis. You see here how it barely intersects that epiphysis there. You, can, you can't draw really a Klein line on a la, uh, frog leg lateral. You have to use a different a method, a different angle, but the frog leg lateral, you can really see it. You can see how that epiphysis is definitely not completely, you know, it's right here. It's not lined up completely with the femoral neck. And so, um, uh, so does anyone have any questions about that? Um, you know, these, um, you'll see these, um, these will come into your clinic. Um, so, you know, it's also why any adolescent that, um, produce that comes in with hip, hip pain, I mean, with knee pain, at least warrants a hip exam, if not hip x-rays. Um, I think x-rays are probably overkill, but at least hip exam. Okay, so question four. You are evaluating a 27-year-old recreational tennis player. She felt some searing chest wall pain on her dominant side while extending for a forehand shot three days ago. On her examination today, you notice a substantial bruising along the anterior chest wall, suggesting some soft tissue injury. You begin by palpating the pectoris major muscle. Of the following points, which is the least helpful when trying to palpate the pectoral magus, uh, uh, the pectoralis major? Sorry, can't talk today. So A, the sternum, B, the clavicle, C, the second to sixth ribs, D, the humerus, or E, the coracoid process. Okay, so the majority of people got this one right. Um, this one is um, uh, E, the coracoid process is the correct answer. Sorry, I was getting rid of those lines. Um, so E, the coracoid process is the correct answer. So this is an anatomy question. There will be anatomy questions on the exam. Um, so the sternum and the second to sixth ribs are the origin of the sternal head of the pec major while the medial clavicle is the origin of the clavicular head. And then the humerus is the insertion of the muscle on the trabecular groove. The coracoid process is the insertion of the pec minor, and the pec minor also inserts onto the scapula, and it originates from the third through fifth ribs. 
So you may get anatomy questions that talk about muscle origins and insertions. You may talk, get anatomy questions that talk about borders of important structures, like such as a quadrilateral space. Um, you may get questions about the orientations of nerves and muscles and vascular structures to each other. For example, you know, they may say, you know, in the tarsal tunnel, where does the nerve lie in relation to the flexor hallucis longus, those kind of questions. So you will have those kind of questions. Obviously, it's hard to review all anatomy on um, before your exam, but trying to review some of the like big, you know, the bit like the big major ones that um, that kind of commonly get asked, like quadrilateral space, those kind of things. Any questions about that before we go on? Okay. Question five. A 25 year old male who's preparing to travel to high altitude requests a prescription for acetazolamide. He denies prior altitude sickness. He has no underlying chronic conditions. Which statement is true of this medicine? A, it masks the symptoms of acute mountain sickness. B, it causes decreased urination. C, will cause a dry cough and increasing dyspnea at increasing altitudes. Or D, could cause, cause paresthesias of the hands, feet, and periorbital region. Okay, so um, the vast majority of people got this one right. 76% um, uh, got D, could cause paresthesias of the hands, feet, and periorbital region. So altitude sickness, so acetazolamide is used to speed acclimatization. It reduces the incidence and reduces the severity of, of acute mountain sickness. It doesn't mask symptoms, however. Uh, side effects include paresthesia of the periorbital region, hands and feet, as well as diuresis. So it increases urination. That's why D was right. And um, it also can cause carbonated beverages to taste flat. Um, and it also actually may improve sleep quality. Um, it should be avoided in people with a sulfa allergy. The typical dose is 500 milligrams per day, either in one dose or divided doses. Uh, that 250 BID started one day prior. Um, and there are some new, newer studies that have shown that lower dose of 125 milligrams BID is just is as effective almost, but has less side effects. So some people are using the smaller dose now. Um, answer C on here, cough and dyspnea are signs of hate. Um, and so that's, um, that's what that uh, answer was describing. Um, acute mountain sickness, uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, occurs within six to 12 hours of altitude exposure. And may, it may present up to five days. So like you can continue to get symptoms for five days after initial ascent. Uh, symptoms include headache, nausea, vomiting, anorexia, dizziness, lightheadedness, and fatigue. Um, risk factors for it are previous history of it. Uh, the rate of ascent. So the faster you ascend, the higher the incidence. It, the higher the altitude you go, also the higher the incidence. Usually it occurs at altitudes greater than 2,500 meters. Um, higher sleeping altitudes. So if you sleep at higher altitudes, you're more likely to get it. Heavy exertion, lack of acclimatization, and then sedative drugs and or alcohol can also increase your risk factors. So any questions about acute, mount, uh, I'm sorry, about altitude sickness? Okay. Question six. A 40-year-old runner presents to your clinic with right lateral knee pain. This has been ongoing for the past six months and worsens with running or walking downhill. On palpation, the pain is localized to the lateral femoral condyle. Ober's and Noble's tests are equivocal. McMurray's test is normal. And hyperflexion of the D does not reproduce the pain. Vera stress test is normal. The pain is reproduced with resisted active internal rotation of the tibia with the patient lying prone and his knee flexed to 30 degrees. X-rays of the knee are normal. The patient has been in physical therapy for the past four months without any improvement. What is your diagnosis? A, iliotibial band syndrome. B, lateral meniscus tear. 
C, lateral collateral ligament sprain, or D, popliteus tendinopathy? Okay, so um, uh, this one, the answer is D, popliteus tendinopathy. Um, the majority of you got it, 69%. Um, so popliteus um, is characterized by walking, uh, pain with walking or running downhill, um, or cause, and it causes posterior lateral knee pain. Um, it, the popliteus tendon originates from the lateral femoral condyle, it also comes off the back of the lateral meniscus and the inferior portion of the, L, um, I'm sorry, of the, yeah, the inferior to where the L, L, LCL inserts. Um, and then it inserts at the fibula. Um, pain is reproducible with palpation of the lateral femoral condyle while in a figure four that's called a Garrick's test. Um, and then symptoms may be reproduced with the patient lying prone, the knee flexed at 30 degrees, and then internal uh, existence against, um, I'm sorry, and then internal rotation against resistance. Um, iliotibial band, so those are Obers and Nobles tests. So Obers test obvious is the laying on your side and allowing um, full adduction of the legs to stretch um, the IT band. Nobles test is where you palpate the IT band at the lateral femoral condyle and you take them through flexion and extension and um, a positive test is a click. Um, obviously, a McMurray's is the lateral meniscus and they also mentioned that they did not have pain with hyperflexion, which is usually pretty common with lateral meniscus. And then they also said they had a varus, negative varus stress test. So that would um, be the test for the LCL. Um, someone did put in the chat that they had an um, interesting practical suggestion from the International Medicine Guys and uh, says that a perf if a person does not know or if, if they think they have allergies to sulfa, he suggests that they uh, take acetazolamine and sit in the ER waiting room. Um, yeah, so, I mean, you know, we all have these things where people have these, you know, like allergies or questionable allergies or, you know, my mom said I was allergic to penicillin. In you, we, we know probably the most of those were, you know, they had a rash when they were a baby after they got amoxicillin for a viral illness, you know, so they don't really truly have an, a penicillin allergy. So sometimes it is necessary to kind of give them an allergy challenge. Obviously, you want to do that in a controlled setting where you can treat the allergic response if they have it. I would not suggest doing that with anyone with a history of anaphylactic reaction, though. Um, okay, any questions about the popliteus? This is something that you'll see commonly in runners. And it's going to present very similar to this. They're going to have pain for a while. They're going to have been doing physical therapy for a while. They're going to probably have gone to a couple different doctors and no one's really been able to find it. But the, the key is people have, um, uh, have pain with um, downhill running. So like, so that when they kind of, when they're trying to control the downhill is when they have pain. Okay. Um, question seven: As the team physician for a division, oops, as a uh, team physician for the Division One college, you've been caring for the starting center of the football team. You've seen him weekly in the training room for the last three weeks. His blood pressure on three separate training room visits has been determined to be in stage two hypertension. A thorough workup has been performed, without identifying any secondary causes or signs of in-organ damage. In addition to lifestyle modifications, which to this point have failed you determine the athlete needs to be treated with medication to control the blood pressure. The patient has no me known medication allergies. What would be the best medication to initiate treatment? A, hydrochlorothiazide, B, metoprolol XL, D, deltiazem, or C, or um, I'm sorry, C, deltiazem, or D, lisinopril. So good. Ever um, the majority of people got this one right. Um, this is lisinopril. Um, 
So when we talk about uh, hypertension in athletes, ACE inhibitors or and ARBs tend to be the best tolerated in athletes. Um, so one, they don't have changes in energy metabolism. Um, they don't impair oxygen uptake, so they typically don't affect performance. Um, one of the things that you should consider is because of the uh, um, fetal effects, female athletes should be counseled on some form of contraception. You know, traditionally, um, you you know, always we're taught in primary care that you shouldn't put uh, women of childbearing age on ACE inhibitors and ARBs, but, um, you know, as long as they are aware and are using some form of contraception, obviously, if you have a female athlete with high blood pressure, that may not be an oral contraceptive since those can exacerbate high blood pressure. Um, so HCTZ is a diuretic and it's on the banned substance list. So you don't want, um, uh, you don't, you can't use that in your athletes. Also, um, it may make athletes more prone to dehydration and electrolyte disturbances. Um, beta blockers um, may adversely affect performance, so they can decrease VO2 max. They also decrease cardiac output. Um, so that they're not well tolerated in athletes. Um, if you do have to use a beta blocker, um, typically you wanna choose a cardioselective beta blocker because they'll have less side effects. Um, and also note ban, uh, beta blockers are banned in certain sports. Those include archery, shooting, diving, and figure skating. Um, and while you could consider a, di, a hydroperidine, a calcium channel blocker, such as amylodipine, um, deltiazem is, a, is not that, uh, is the other class of calcium channel blockers, the non-dihydroperidine. And it is more for rate control and doesn't have as much effect on blood pressure. Um, the other thing about this case to kind of talk about is stage two um, hypertension. You really should consider limiting sports participation, especially static sports such as weightlifting until the BP is in better control. Any questions about hypertension athlete? Oh, so thank you. Somebody in the chat did put, um, so there was a typo in that last slide. I knew I'd have some. Um, the popliteus inserts onto the tibia. It can't insert onto the fibula uh, since it comes from the lateral femoral cauda. Sorry, my mouse is a little screwed. Okay, so question eight, which is an important physical exam finding in head trauma? A, battle sign, B, Castell sign, C, Kerr sign, or D, tactile frimitus? Okay, so good. Um, so th this is battle sign. So the reason that I put this on here is, you know, it's kind of, you know, obviously battle sign is ecchymosis over the mastoid. It can be diagnostic of a skull fracture. Castell sign is a percussion test used for splenomegaly. Kerr sign is shoulder pain caused by a splenic rupture. And then tactile frimitus is a test for pneumothorax. So there's gonna be a mix of difficulty of questions on your exam. So some questions will be easy and fairly straightforward. And the key is don't overthink them. You know, some people tend to think, oh, this is a board test. Every question is gonna be really difficult. And that's just not the case. The, the questions are gonna be in a range. So there's gonna be easy ones. There's gonna be ones that are kind of in the middle. And then there are gonna be some really, really difficult ones. But, you know, and then for each person, there may be different things depending on your level of experience and stuff. You may think one question is easy where someone else thinks it's really quite difficult. But, you know, just because a question seems easy to you doesn't mean it's not that you're thinking of it wrong. It, you know, don't try to overthink things. Okay, question nine, a 26-year-old male triathlete presents to your clinic with right shoulder injury after a crash during the bike stage of a race three days prior. He reports that he was 10 miles into the stage when he felt slightly dizzy for a split second. The next thing he remembered, he was on the ground. He was taken to the emergency department where shoulder x-rays were negative. He also had a normal ECG and a normal head CT. He denies any symptoms other than mild pain to his right shoulder. His examination is normal except for an abrasion on his right upper arm. He is hoping for clearance to participate in an event this weekend. Best management for this patient is A, provide wound care instructions and clear to participate as tolerated. 
B, attain a repeat ECG and echo. If both tests are normal, clear him to participate. C, refer him to cardiology and only clear him for running, not cycling or swimming. D, hold him from any athletic participation and refer him to cardiology. Okay, um, so there was a mixture on this one, but the vast majority did, um, I mean, the, the majority got it right. It is, um, the answer is D, hold him from athletic participation and refer him to cardiology. So this question um, is exertional syncope. So based on the history, you must assume that this patient had a syncopal episode with exercise. He could not, I mean, it couldn't have, it, it may not have been syncopal. He may have hit his head and just doesn't remember what happened, doesn't remember the crash, but you kind of have to assume that he had a syncopal episode. Um, synco uh, exertional syncope may be a precursor to sudden cardiac arrest and it demands a full cardiac workup. So while an ECG and an echo may be part of the workup, that's answer B, other testing such as an event monitor, stress test, cardiac MRI, genetic testing have to be considered, and those should be considered in conjunction with one of your cardiology colleagues. Um, history should assess the timing of the syn syncope. So whether it's exertional or post-exertional makes a big difference. Uh, family history, uh, history of pre-syncopal episodes with exercise, and then stimulant use, which can cause um, exertional syncope. Um, if the cardiac evaluation is completely normal, then you need to think of also kind of start to consider neurologic causes such as a seizure. So questions about this one. Okay. Question 10, which of the following has evidence-based support for the use and rehabilitation of ankle sprains? A, electrical stimulation, B, external ankle supports, C, acupuncture, or D, therapeutic ultrasound. Okay, so this one is B, external ankle supports. Um, and so a vast majority got this right, 76%. Um, so um, while all of these may be used in, and commonly used for rehabilitation of um, ankle sprains, um, besides ankle supports such as boots and functional braces, which have good evidence uh, for use in the treatment of ankle sprains and also the prevention of future injury, um, they the other options don't ha lack this uh, lack the uh, similar levels of evidence based support. So there will be a lot of questions about ev I mean not a lot but there will be questions about evidence based treatment. The answers on the test are typically going to follow evidence based treatment guidelines, not necessarily standard of care or what is done in practice, but really what the evidence says should be done. Okay. Question eleven: A nineteen year old female soccer goalie receives a direct blow from the face. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, to the face from blocking a shot on goal. She develops pain and blurry vision in her right eye and is removed from the field. On exam, you see a collection of blood in the anterior chamber of the right eye and diagnose her with a hyphema. Appropriate management includes which of the following? A, since the hyphema collection is less than 25% of the anterior chamber, she may be continue to play with use of protective eyewear. B, advise the patient to rest safely apply ice, take anti-inflammatories as needed for pain, and follow up with her ophthalmologist in the next one to two days. C, start antibiotic ointment immediately as uh, this is a high likelihood of developing a bacterial infection. Or D, refer to an ophthalmologist for prompt evaluation. Okay, so the answer here is D, 77% um, got that uh, correct as well. 
So a hyphema is a collection of blood in the anterior chamber of the eye. It's usually due to damage to the microvasculature of the ciliary body. So you can see a picture here where the blood is in the anterior chamber there. Symptoms include pain, swelling, blurry vision, photophobia, and pupillary uh, constriction or dilation can occur either one. Um, and uh, patients may have nausea and vomiting as well. It requires prompt evaluation by an ophthalmologist to assess for more severe eye trauma. So it can be a sign of globe rupture and other it's more severe eye trauma also can have retinal injury in addition to the, anti the hyphema. So that's why it requires prompt evaluation. Treatment is a rigid non-occlusive shield, bed rest with head elevation, discontinuing insets and close follow-up as these are prone to re-bleed. Um, it can lead to glaucoma. You can get particulate accumulation or corneal staining. Um, you can also have a concomitant retinal injury, and then again, it's at risk for re-bleeding. Um, a is not correct because you should never return these athletes to the field um, that day. Uh, B is not correct, one, because it's not a prompt evaluation. It said one to two days, but also because it specifically says they can take NSAIDs, which you always want to hold any NSAIDs or blood thinners or anything like that. C is the answer for treatment for a corneal abrasion. So it's a uh, treatment for a different condition. Questions about that? Okay, question 12. During a karate tournament, an eight-year-old male has a primary tooth knocked out. After thorough exam, it was found to be a complete avulsion with no fracture. No swelling of his gum line is noted and there are no concerns for airway obstruction. Uh, what do you do with the tooth? A, stop the bleeding and do nothing with the tooth. B, place the tooth in a Hanks balanced saline solution. C, place the tooth in normal saline solution. D, place the tooth in the mouth next to the buco, uh, buccal mucosa, or E, place the tooth in room temperature tap water. Okay, so the, the key here is this is a primary tooth. So for a primary tooth, you stop the bleeding and you do nothing. This was a tough question. The, the answers are pretty much um, everybody, about a quarter for everyone. No one chose E, um, but a quarter for all the other ones. So um, tooth avulsion, a primary tooth should never be replanted. Um, and so since this is a primary tooth, you just control the bleeding and do nothing. Now, if we were talking about a permanent tooth avulsion, um, you would want an emergent referral to a dentist as it should be replanted as soon as possible. The longer it goes without being replanted, the less viable and likely the tooth is. Um, replacing the tooth in socket is the best, best management. But if that's not possible, B, C, and D are all viable solutions to store the tooth. E is better than dry storage, but it's not ideal. So the other thing that should kind of clue you in is like that B, C, and D are all correct answers for if you were talking about a permanent tooth. So that's to clue you in that, like reread the question, you're, you may be missing something there. Um, always handle by the crown of the tooth, never by the root. And you may rinse the root with saline, but do not scrub the root. Questions about tooth avulsion. Okay. Question 13, which of the following statements is true regarding proximal humeral epiphysolysis or Lidl Leaguer shoulder? It typically occurs in pitchers aged eight to 10 years old. A widened proximal humeral physis on plain radiograph clinches the diagnosis. C, the athlete is usually pain-free until the onset of a pain. And D, it is caused by repetitive loading of the shoulder with both torque and distraction forces. Okay, so good, Every, um, the majority of people got this right, 76%, it is D. It's caused by repetitive loading of the shoulder with both torque and distraction forces. 
So um, you'll probably never get through one of my question sessions without a question about baseball. So, um, so repetitive torque and distraction of the humerus causes microtrauma, which irritates the epiphysis. Oh, sorry. Um, it can occur as young as eight, but the typical age is uh, 11 to 16. It typically occurs in pitchers and catchers, in, but it may be seen in other overhead athletes, namely tennis players. So don't, um, don't uh, think it only occurs in baseball athletes. Um, usually progressive worsening of pain with throwing is the presenting symptom. The pain is usually um, diffuse and not um, localized. So it's kind of a vague pain, just like most rotator cuff shoulder pain. It's kind of like a vague deltoid type pain. You can have pain to palpation of the epiphysis. So if you palpate along the proximal epiphysis, it can hurt. And you also get pain with rotator cuff strength testing, which will lead some people think rotator cuff tendinopathy or tendinitis, very unusual in adolescence. Um, but it's because the rotator cuff is pulling on the epiphysis as well. Um, you may see widening of the physis on x-ray. However, this is, does not clinch or diagnose it because um, first of all, widening can be normal in non-throwers, but especially in asymptomatic throwers, they can get widening of their physis and be completely asymptomatic. You can get comparison views to the other side, but again, even the dominant side can have asymmetric widening and that's not necessarily pathologic. If you're really concerned, MRI may be used to confirm the diagnosis as you will see edema around the physis, but mainly MRI is used to rule out other etiologies. Um, the treatment is cessation from throwing and typically it's three months. Um, physical therapy for rotator cuffs and scapular stabilization is important. Do not forget about the kinetic chain when you talk about your pictures. So they should, I start physical therapy immediately in these people, even though I don't want the physical therapist to even work on their shoulder at the beginning. I want them to focus purely on kinetic chain at the, be at the beginning, working on glutes and hamstrings core, because if, Baseball players are throwing with their arm and only and not using the rest of their kinetic chain. They're going to get problems with their elbow and their shoulder. Um, and then after symptoms resolution, you would start an interval throwing program and a gradual return to uh, throwing. It wouldn't be all um, the one. Um, prevention. So prevention is um, you can prevent it by adhering to pitch counts, though pitch counts, again, remember, are a suggestion based on averages. So there are athletes that can completely follow every pitch count and they can still run into problems. So they're not an absolute. Um, typically rest from year round throwing is the big thing. So typically we want people to take about three months off, especially young throwers off of throwing. Um, you discourage pitching on multiple teams or multiple leagues at the same time. I also talk to my pa uh, patients about pitching and catching. So a lot of the problems is on these little league teams, they're not just pitchers, they play other positions. So they'll pitch and they'll hit, hit their 85 pitch count mark and then they'll go play catcher and they're literally throwing every time the pitcher is throwing. So those are kind of things that we talk about. Um, you know, like if you have, I talk to them about like, if you have pitch your 85, maybe go to first base, you know, or D, you know, somewhere like that where you don't have to throw as much. Um, there is a website called Pitch Smart. Pitch Smart is run by Major League Baseball and a lot of the sports medicine societies. It has great resources as far as prevention and things like that. Okay, so just to clarify, you were saying that widening of the physis with proper clinical precision is a valuable finding, but x-ray alone without symptoms does not make the diagnosis. Yes, so exactly. So that's exactly that. So if you have pay, pay, somebody with symptoms of little league or shoulder, and then you see widening of the physis on x-ray that can help clue. Yes, that can help confirm your diagnosis, but just widening alone in the absence of symptoms is not pathologic. So you can never just get um, uh, x-rays and assume based on the patient, it's x-rays that they have little league or shoulder, which the problem is, is that when you have when you're getting outside radiologists or radiologists to read your x-rays that have never seen this, the patient, you know, like this person could have, you know, like the other day, for example, I had a baseball player that fell on his shoulder, you know, like was sliding into a base, fell on his shoulder, no, no pain with throwing or anything like that prior. And then we get x-rays looking for obviously like a clavicle, just a clavicle fracture or something like that. And the radiologist reads widening of the epiphysis concerning for little league or shoulder.
So, you know, things like that. Don't, you can't always, you know, never take the x-rays in isolation. The clinical picture is important. Okay. And Andy put the um, website for Pitch Smart in um, the chat for everybody. So you have it. It's a great resource. It's great for patients too. They have a lot of good resources for, um, for parents and, um, and athletes as well on there. Okay. Question 14, which of the following is true of D. Corvain's tenosynovitis? The two tendons involved are the abductor pollicis brevis and the extensor pollicis longus. B, grind test is the most sensitive test for diagnosis. C, a corticosteroid injection to the tendon sheath of the second dorsal compartment has been shown to alleviate symptoms. Or D, splinting of the thumb and wrist can relieve symptoms. Okay, so we're going to speed up a little bit because we're running out of time, but D, splinting of the thumb and wrist can relieve symptoms. So for D. Quervain's tenosynovitis, it's the first dorsal extensor tendon compartment, which involves the extensor pollicis brevis and the abductor pollicis longus. I put this question in here because when you're on question 99, it's very easy to kind of gloss over and read things quickly. Just make sure you're paying attention. Uh, Finkelstein's test is the most sensitive test. The grind test is for CMCOA. Um, and cord again, corticosteroids of the first, not the second dorsal uh, compartment may alleviate symptoms. Okay, uh, question 15. What is the structure labeled in the sagittal and transverse imaging of the shoulder? A, the ulnar nerve, B, the supraspinatus tendon, C, the tendon of the long head of the biceps brachii, D, the tendon of the short head of the biceps brachii, or E, the axillary nerve? Okay, so this one is C, the tendon of the long um, head of the biceps brachii. Um, so there will be ultrasound questions on the test. They are fair games. So um, if you don't do a lot of ultrasound, that's something that may be used um, uh, worth reviewing. Um, and there will also be some questions on procedures as well, not just ultrasound guided procedures, um, but other procedures as well. So those are those are the, those are categories that are on the test. Okay, question sixteen: Normal growth and regeneration of muscle tissue in response to training or injury is controlled by satellite cells. Which of the following activates these satellite cells? A. Myosin. B. Insulin-like growth factor one. C. Interleukin seven. Or D. Interleukin three. Okay, so 77% um, of people got this one right. It's insulin-like growth factor one. So insulin uh, growth factor one is a primary regulator of satellite cells, which is a major, and a major mediator of growth hormone. Satellite cells are precursors to skeletal muscle, and they aid in muscle repair. Uh, hepatocyte growth factor and fibroblast growth factor are also important in muscle repair. Uh, myosin is a muscle protein that constitutes the myofilaments. It's, it's not um, a... Um, hormone. Um, IL-7 is involved in the differentiation and proliferation of lymphoid uh, progenitor cells, which are increased pro-inflammatory cytokines. And IL-3 activates hematopoietic stem cells and mast cells. So this is an exercise physiology question. There will be exercise physiology questions on the exam. Um, base, they call them basic science of sports medicine questions, um, and there will be, uh, they will be on your exam. So that is something that I always recommend fellows review because most of us do not get that a lot in our clinical practice. While we get some of it throughout the year, it's definitely something you want to review closer to CAQ kind of time. Okay, question 17, 24-year-old male deep scuba diving with his friends. He starts swimming off course. His friends go after him, and he's not responding to them appropriately. They swim him to the surface, and within a few minutes, he's back to normal. Which gas is responsible for this reaction? A, helium, B, nitrogen, C, oxygen, D, carbon dioxide.
So this one is B, nitrogen. 74% uh, of people got this one right. So um, nitrogen can cause a narcotic effect, producing symptoms including confusion, disturbed coordination, lack of concentration, hallucination, and even unconsciousness. It's known as rapture of the deep. Um, and so nitrogen is the highest concentration in the atmosphere. It's the gas that has the highest concentration in the atmosphere. So as the pressure increases at deeper depths, the solubility of the gas is such that it can increase in body tissue. Um, oxygen and or ascent are used to treat nitrogen narcosis. Um, this is part of like dive medicine questions. So you will have questions on, you know, there will be questions about dive medicine. We already talked about altitude. So different other like, um, wilderness medicine, things like that. So again, if this is something you don't get a lot in your clinical practice, it's worth reviewing prior to the CAQ. Question 18, which of the following findings on ECG would not be considered a normal physiologic adaptation to training in an athlete? A, sinus bradycardia greater than or equal to 30 beats per minute. B, a QTC of 490 milliseconds. C, first degree heart block. Or D, incomplete right bundle branch block. Okay, so this one is B, a Q, uh, QTC of not, uh, 490 milliseconds. 62% uh, of people got that one. Um, so a QTC greater than 740 milliseconds in men or 480 milliseconds in women is not a normal physiological adaptation to training and warrants uh, further evaluation. Long QT can be caused by genetic causes. Also, it can be medication induced. It does predispose uh, athletes to tachyarrhythmias. Um, all the other ECG findings are considered normal and asymptomatic athletes. Again, always remember that the Seattle criteria and EKG findings only applies to asymptomatic athletes. Um, due to increased vagal, so basically um, these ECG finders are due to increased vagal tone and enlarged cardiac chamber size as a response to exercise. There will be questions about ECGs. There will be questions about the Bethesda guidelines. These are high, high yield. Make sure that you, you knows those, okay? Question 19, the administrative responsibilities include developing policy and procedures related to medical injuries and conditions that could affect the athlete's participation in sport. Which statement is not correct? A, maintain written policies outlining communication, testing, and outside consultant referrals. B, keep medical records documenting pre-potation patient physicals, injuries, treatment, risk of sports participation, and return to play decisions. C, review policies and procedures regularly. D, there is no need to follow state or federal guidelines if you're following the guidance of the NCAA. Okay, so the answer to this one is D. Everybody got this one right, so that's really good. Um, so yes, yeah, so um, there will be questions about the role of team physician as well as legality concerns as far as being a team physician. There usually are a few questions on every test about that. Um, obviously for this one, if, you're, if the NCAA guidelines dif uh, are differ from your state and local guidelines, you go with your state and local guidelines. A good example of this would be co well, um, COVID. You know, early on in COVID, when um, the NCAA was allowing participation, if you were in a municipality that still wasn't allowing groups to meet over, you know, five or 10, then you had to defer to those state and local guidelines, no matter what the NCAA said. Okay, last question. Which of the following is not part of the U.S. Health and Human Services Physical Activity Guidelines for Adults? A, participate in bone strengthening physical activity at least three days a week. B, move more and sit less throughout the day. C, perform at least 150 to 300 minutes per week of moderate intensity or 75 to 150 minutes per week of vigorous intensity aerobic physical activity. Or D, participate in moderate intensity or greater intensity muscle strengthening that involves all major muscle groups on two or more days per week.
Okay, I'm kind of interested in, uh, to see the results on this one, what, what people say about this one. Okay, so um, uh, kind of like I thought. So this is kind of across the board. So the actual correct answer is A. So A is, in a, while it's not inappropriate for adults, Bone strengthening physical activity is actually a recommendation of the um, HHS for children and adolescents for 16 to 17. They, it's not a recommendation for adults. Um, all the others are uh, part of the recommendation for adults. So you will have things like this on the exam. They'll ask about national guidelines. Um, so it's important to review like position statements um, and guidelines from not only a AMSSM, but also other, um, of other um, national um, entities. So kind of take home points um, and you can put any questions that you have in the chat. Um, we'll still take a little bit of time or a little bit over, but we'll take some time to answer questions because uh, um, it's important to get your questions answered. So take home points. One, there will be a mix of easy, medium and hard questions. So don't be concerned if you think a question's easy and you're trying to find like the catch. Don't overthink the questions. There will be some that are kind of more of a little bit of a softball. Um, review topics that you don't commonly see in clinics. So exercise physiology, special populations, we didn't really mention that, but like um, uh, pregnant athletes, uh, disabled athletes, um, elderly, they, they, there will be some questions about special populations. Dive medicine, altitude medicine, wilderness medicine, other things you don't commonly see. Anatomy, muscle origin and insertion, nerve orientation, are all fair game. Um, review national guidelines and AMSSM positions um, papers. There will be questions about them. And a lot of times they will literally be like, in the 2014 guidelines by ACOG, what does it, you know, I mean, it will literally be right word for word from the position uh, paper. Um, and then mo like we talked about, most of the answers will go off evidence-based guidelines, not necessarily what you do in clinical practice always. We all know that Sometimes clinical medicine doesn't exactly follow evidence-based medicine. So, you know, um, just kind of review some of those things. Um, so I actually took my recertification test last year. So um, when you take your recertification test, you get a scorecard and they actually break it down by, um, by um, categories. And so you get what, so this is what percentage of my test that I took was in each category. So there was 1% of the test on the role of the team physician. 16% uh, was on basic science of sports. I did not like that 16% very much. I'll tell you, <laughs> health promotion, prevention aspects of sports medicine was 20%. Uh, emergency assessment and care was 8%. And then 50% of the test was diagnosis management prescription of sports related injuries. Um, and then musculoskeletal rehab was 3%. And then procedures were 2%. So that's kind of a breakdown there. Um, so uh, Andy wanted me to remind everybody at the end of the month that um, you will be opening to um, register for um, AMSSM National Conference. Um, again, there is a CAQ prep there for fellows. Okay, so I'm gonna get to some of these questions. Okay, does anyone know if there'll be a board review course this year in June? Um, I don't know, Andy, if you know, I do not know about June. Like I said, I do know there one is you one almost always at the national meeting. Um, and then Andy put here's a there is a virtual course option available um, that he put in the chat. Um, and then Zach asked anybody aware of good question bank for sports medicine CAQ. Um, I would love to do something similar to you world. It seems the best viable option. Um, so, like I said, you know, we these questions come from the um, the book. Um, there also is a question bank with um, uh, at in the AMSSM testing center. They have past tests um, that have a question bank, so you can use all those resources. Um, you know, past fellows, everybody that took their test, you know, their re, oh, either primary or recertification. You know, they get that scorecard that kind of breaks down the category. So, if you know someone that took their test last year or in the last few years. It may be worthwhile to ask them, you know, what was your breakdown? And that kind of gives you an idea. Um, um, Andy said he's going to get clarification from Mayo on um, if they're planning an in-person option. Um, I have board vitals and it's pretty close to what we went through. 
Um, and then somebody put in the test that someone um, that the past fellow from UK made a question bank. So. Okay, so um, if there's no more questions, if you have any more questions, you can um, continue to put them in the chat. I'll hang out for a little bit. Um, thank everybody for joining. We had a big group today, which is good. Um, you know, I know that this, this is a really big topic, um, but, you know, you've been learning a lot of sports medicine throughout the year. You know a lot of this stuff. Trust your instincts and, and you're going to do well. <laughs>